Okay, welcome to today's lecture about fish, the first of two. What I want to do is I want to talk to you about the diversity of fishes and some of the anatomical features that they have to swim and move around the world and encounter the challenges associated with life in a liquid medium and the diversity of ways in which they do that. So we're going to start by uh, going through some of the ways in fish function and swim and the fins they use to do that. And then after that, we'll go through the diversity of fishes and I'll tell some stories along the way. Now, I really love fish and I come by that love honestly because it has been a big part of my li life ever since I was a kid. And just by way of example, here's uh, some pictures of the family uh, and myself um, with fish of various types and various kinds over the years, my brother, my daughters, um, and myself. And it just keeps on going. So my brother again, my wife in the lower left hand corner, my kids again on the right. And it continues into the, the present with a great interest from all of our family in fish. That's my cousin there in the lower left. And uh, it goes all the way back to my parents. So on the upper left there, you have my father on the right in 1954 in the Bella Coola Valley of British Columbia. And on the lower left, you have my mom uh, on the right of the lower left image with uh, her grandfather, in the, with her father in the car, my grandfather, uh, with a Chinook salmon from the Sacramento, uh, San Joaquin uh, area of the San Francisco Bay area. And then my dad, of course, taught me to fish. So on the right, there I am in interior British Columbia uh, with my dad. And I became so fascinated by fish that I made sure to do that, you know, as a major focus in my undergraduate degree, but also I did my graduate work at the School of Fisheries at the University of Washington, where in addition to doing research and doing my own fishing, fish permeated all aspects of life, uh, including Halloween parties where my future wife carved the sockeye salmon in my head for, uh, for the Halloween party. So there it is. Really fish are the beginning of what we're talking about in this course from the perspective of vertebrate life. So up to this point, everything else has been invertebrates and now we're going to transition into vertebrates. We'll include many of the things that people would traditionally have thought of as animals like lions and tigers and birds and snakes and things like that. So what you're looking at here is a pie chart of uh, vertebrate diversity according to some of the traditional taxonomic names that you have like Aves for birds, uh, Anura for frogs, Mammalia for mammals. And on the right hand side is basically all the fishes. Now what you can see is looking at this is that um, within this diversity of vertebrate life, about half of those are what we currently traditionally, or you could say colloquially call fishes. Now in reality, fishes are a paraphyletic group because they include within that thing called fishes, many things that have evolved from the fish group, but that we no longer colloquially call fish. So from an evolutionary perspective, everything on that uh, diagram there is a fish, but from a colloquial or traditional uh, taxonomic phrase uh, perspective, only the ones on the right. And you can see that basically the things we call fish today are roughly half of all vertebrate diversity when it comes to numbers of species. Here's uh, converting that into the first phylogeny you'll see for this particular group. And this is just representing various splits in the phylogenetic tree uh, going up from um, craniata, which is number one, the split down there. And then from that, right after that, so it's the evolution of the crania. You have uh, the group called hagfishes coming off. Then you have the evolution of vertebrae. And this is why the previous graph had vertebrae, vertebrate in parentheses, uh, in quotations, because in fact, hagfish do not have vertebrae. And yet, we sort of generally tend to group them in the vertebrates, but really they're craniates because they have a cranium, but they don't yet have vertebrae. So you can see the different terminologies applied to the phylogenetic tree here. And then on the top, you have those traditional or colloquial groupings that people tend to call them. So our main focus here is in talking about this vertebrate group. And so as you can gather from what we've just said, one of the major defining features of this group, also via the name, is that they have vertebrae all except the hagfishes. 
Now the vertebrae represent a major innovation in life because they basically create this rigid solid structure within the body that is still flexible via the different vertebrae for which you have lots of places for muscle attachment and the attachment of uh, the pelvic pectoral and the pelvic girdles, your uh, arms and your legs, as well as support for the skull, the cranium. And so these vertebrae are very important in the way vertebrates function. Now there's a great diversity of uh, vertebrate vertebral types within the vertebrate group. And so here are some uh, depictions of what the vertebrae look like in sort of a primitive or um, early split, split in the vertebrate group. And you have uh, more derived bony fishes like a salmon, for example, on the left there, like typical fish vertebrae that you might get when you're eating a salmon in the, in the restaurant. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you have uh, tetrapods, including from the early tetrapods. Those are, of course, vertebrates that walk out on land and have four limbs into more derived tetrapods like ourselves or like a cow or something like that uh, on the lower right. And so I'm not going to go into any detail about these different types of vertebrae. I just want to make the point here that you have a great diversity of vertebral types within vertebrata. And those vertebral types uh, tend to show evolutionary trajectories associated with uh, different forms of life. For example, the tetrapod bones, the tetrapod vertebrae are much more robust and more solid, which suits the fact that they have to get out of water and support uh, themselves up on their limbs, which are attached to the vertebrae, uh, to the vertebral column out of the water. Uh, and so they need, need a much more, much more robust structure than the fish, which is suspended in the water on the left there. So one of the things that fish do really well is they move around quickly and powerfully in the water. And so what I want to do is I want to talk a bit about how they swim and about how that swimming enables them to go about their daily tasks, acquiring food, escaping predators, obtaining mates, things like that, by generating thrust and overcoming drag and gravity. Okay, so up on the upper left there, you have a generic fish, maybe something like a salmonid or a salmon. Uh, you can tell that by the adipose fin, which is not found in other fishes. And it just shows the dorsal fin, the caudal fin, the anal fin, pelvic fins, and pectoral fins, all of which will be repeated throughout the rest of this lecture. So now you've got uh, this structure, this vertebral column with muscles attached to it, and fins that are going to move you through the water and allow you to go about and live your life. So. These are some of the things that a fish has to deal with as it's moving through its medium. So the first thing is, is that gravity is obviously pushing the fish downward, much less so in water than you would see out of water because water is a denser medium. Nonetheless, gravity is forcing the fish downward. At the same time, you can combat that with various forms of buoyancy and lift, making yourself a float or generating um, propulsive movements that will keep you up in the water column. At the same time, you have drag as you're trying to move forward, and this drag comes in terms of frictional drag, or inertial drag, or turbulence drag, and we're going to talk about these different forms of drags a little bit later. And you can uh, combat that drag and move yourself forward via thrust, that is, using your fins or body to push yourself forward. Now, as you do so, if you're generating thrust from the back of the fin, from the back of the fish, then you can have those various um, potentially undesired movements of the head end as you uh, move the back end. So for example, as you're swimming forward, uh, moving your tail backwards and forwards like this, that might make the head move in the opposite direction and that's called yaw. So you don't want your fish going, like, you don't want your head going like this. I'm turning the fish sideways now. As you move your tail like this, you don't want your head having to go like that the whole time. Also, as you're generating thrust from the back with your back fin, that might, depending on how you're generating that thrust, force the head up or down. That's called pitch. Now that might be desirable if you want to go down or up, but at other times it might not be desirable. And then depending on how you're generating thrust, you might also roll around the longitudinal axis of uh, your propulsion forward. So pitch, yaw, and roll are all things you might want to manipulate to your advantage to maneuver through your world, but they might also be things that you want to counteract so that you can maintain a straight and level course, even though you're applying severe, uh, a lot of force or thrust at the back. 
Now your fins and body, but really the fins are what enable this thrust while generating the appropriate and controlling the appropriate pitch, law, pitch yaw, and roll. So the fins are sticking up, for instance, into the, uh, away from the longitudinal axis of the fish so that they won't roll unless the fish wants to roll because the fins are sticking out and stopping the roll, just as one example. And the pectoral fins you can manipulate up or down to influence the degree of pitch that the fish has as you swim forward. So as outlined here, you want to be able to generate thrust moving forward while minimizing the resistance and the drag as you try to move through the water. And at the same time, you want to overcome gravity by generating lift. So fish generate thrust in a variety of different ways using their body and their fins. And here is an outline of several of the different forms of locomotion, depending on uh, from top to bottom, the part of the body that is generating that thrust and the form of the thrust, whether it be uh, an undulation that is sort of a sinuous movement like a snake or whether it's an oscillation like an oar going back and forth like this. And so you see they're named after the different groups from skates and rays in the upper left, which are using their pectoral fins. And you saw that in the introductory video. Over to the right, you have lab reform fishes named after this group of wrasses, which mainly use their pectoral fins for movement. Uh, moving down to the ostracoform swimming, you also saw in the video from the box fishes, down to tuniform swimming, uh, tuniform swimming, uh, like those rainbow runners from the video. Karangaform swimming like the sharks, or to anguilliform swimming like the um, garden eels in the video. And so you can see that it's characterized, oh, and ballistiform swimming as well, which you also saw from the trigger fish in the video. So pretty much most of those forms of swimming were shown in the video. Now, two forms that weren't shown in the video are here, and that is where it's the anal fin that does an undulation. Uh, and that's common in knife fishes or gymnotiforms, and so it's called gymnotiform swimming. And below that, you have um, the bow fin, which does an incredible oscillation, undulation of the dorsal fin, which I'll have a video for a little bit later. Uh, and that's called amiform swimming because these are amiformes, this group. So they tend to be named after the group that shows that type of swimming. Now, I just want to make clear that all of these fishes use all of these fins. And if you remember from the introductory video, for example, the trigger fish, you could see the nice uh, movements of the dorsal and anal fins making it ballistiform swimming, but at the same time its pectoral fins were constantly moving and adjusting it again, trying to control pitch, law, pitch, yaw, and roll in the way that the fish wanted. If you go back and watch that video, you'll notice it rolling and turning as it's trying to get access to the urchin while keeping other fish away. Although fishes use, different kinds of fishes use all of the different types of fins for this purpose, uh, the tail, the caudal fin is used particularly often. Now, there are several different forms of the caudal fin outlined here. Uh, depending on the symmetry of the fin and whether the top lobe or the bottom lobe is where the fleshy part and some often the spinal column, uh, the vertebral column will extend into. On the top part, you have the hypocircle tail, which is uh, the, the body is extending into the lower lobe. And that's really not found anymore in extant fishes. In the middle, you have um, the heterocircle tail, which is the epicircle form, where it's moving up into the upper lobe of the fin. Uh, and that's common in modern day sharks, as I'll show in a minute. And then the homocircle tail uh, below that, where it's a symmetrical, the, the uh, vertebral column ends in, in a straight line, and then you have the fin around the outside of that. And here is a representation of where they fall on, that, on a phylogeny of fishes in a particular form of the phylogeny. And so you can see that basically all of the um, ancestral early evolved forms, the early splits are characterized by the heterocircle tail, particularly the epicircle in modern fishes. You can see them across the top there. Uh, and that only when you get to the teleostei, one of the later more derived recently evolved groups, uh, do you see the evolution of the homocircle tail? And in fact, it's going to be a synapomorphy or synapomorphy, shared, unique, derived character in those fishes. Now, this heterocircle tail can sometimes be extreme. And so here's my favorite example. This is the thresher shark up here with this incredibly long extension of the upper part of the caudal fin. You might think that'd be really inefficient for swimming, 
but these fish are also quite know quite well known for their leaping ability and so there's a thresher shark that's leaping out of the ocean right there and I've seen many pictures of thresher sharks leaping way out of the water The thresher shark has one of the most brilliant tails in the underwater kingdom. Spanning up to the entire length of its body, the slender elongated top half of its caudal fin has evolved into something of an unusual but highly efficient hunting weapon. Using a whip-like motion, threshers are able to stun, maim, and even kill small fish prey. This technique is referred to as tail smacking and is believed to be the shark's primary method of hunting. It likely evolved to overcome the difficulty of hunting one small fish at a time, as the sharks here captured three fish on average, and sometimes as many as seven. Its effectiveness comes from both physical contact with the fish and the wave force generated through the water. It is also speculated that sometimes these slaps are so powerful they break apart water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. Like many sharks, threshers have undergone a dramatic decline in the past decade and are listed as a threatened species. Dr. Simon Oliver and his team hope discoveries like this will help conservation groups better understand their habitats and develop more informed efforts to protect the sharks.